Si vous nous regardez, uh, vous so if you're, you're watching us, you're attending the International Conference on interna Intellectual Property. We belong to the fourth and final roundtable for today's program. The, uh, the fresh battle against counterfeiting innovation uh, to defend rights. Uh, now, um, we're going to be introducing you to our panelists. We, and uh, that end, uh, we're going to be handing over to our moderator. Over to the first video. La contrefaçon, ce sont des chiffres colossaux. C'est 3% du commerce mondial. C'est euh, 38 000 emplois perdus rien qu'en France. Et ce sont des pertes fiscales très importantes puisque les contrefacteurs ne payent aucune TVA. Le e-commerce a vraiment euh, engendré un développement important de la contrefaçon puisque le e-commerce permet d'exporter plus facilement des produits de contrefaçon par exemple fabriqués en Chine euh, pour toucher euh, l'ensemble des pays du monde. Sur les 11 derniers mois, 25 entreprises membres de l'Unifab ont fait des référencés plus de 27 millions de produits de contrefaçon en ligne. Si vous mettez ça en perspective avec les saisies douanières annuelles qui sont autour de 5 millions, vous voyez bien qu'aujourd'hui, le commerce en ligne est devenu le fournisseur numéro un en matière de produits de contrefaçon, tous secteurs d'activité confondus. Aujourd'hui, de plus en plus, les produits de contrefaçon arrivent par petits colis, ce qui rend vraiment difficile pour les douanes, notamment tout ce qui est identification et interception des produits de contrefaçon. La propriété intellectuelle, c'est vraiment un prérequis nécessaire pour pouvoir lutter contre la contrefaçon. Il est absolument crucial de déposer des titres de propriété industrielle et d'utiliser tous les mécanismes de propriété intellectuelle pour se protéger, parce que sans ça, on ne pourra pas avoir gain de cause dans des actions de lutte anti-contrefaçon. Il faut aussi avoir une surveillance qui permette de repérer la contrefaçon. Il faut travailler en collaboration avec les douanes. Il y a aussi des initiatives qui sont des initiatives plus privé, de la coopération entre les entreprises, de l'échange d'informations, des chartes de bonne conduite qui ont été signées notamment sur Internet en France. Et puis, il faut que les entreprises attaquent systématiquement et poursuivent les contrefacteurs. Aujourd'hui, 80% des contrefaçons qui sont saisies aux frontières de l'Union européenne proviennent de Chine et de Hong Kong. Donc c'est un territoire qui est vraiment très important dans le monde de la contrefaçon. Je travaille beaucoup avec des entreprises françaises qui sont intéressées par le marché chinois. Nous, on a vraiment un rôle de facilitateur à jouer, c'est-à-dire qu'on va essayer d'accompagner les entreprises françaises, de les épauler dans leurs actions lorsque c'est possible, et également de faciliter leurs relations avec les autorités locales. Nous sommes un fabricant d'objets, d'objets de mesure médicale. Après les appareils qui permettent ces mesures, on développe des services pour accompagner ces personnes dans leur vie quotidienne. Tous les chiffres d'affaires, qu'ils soient en France ou à l'étranger, nous exposent à la contrefaçon. Les, les exemples de contrefaçon les plus profonds qu'on a eus, ce sont des copies quasiment serviles de, de, de nos produits. Pas forcément par des entreprises chinoises, ça peut être des entreprises françaises. Notre stratégie est bien sûr de s'appuyer sur les, sur les demandes de brevets, qui est une propriété intellectuelle très forte, mais qui reste complexe parce qu'elle est difficile à faire reconnaître, notamment par la justice, qui n'a pas forcément les compétences rapides et donc on doit faire intervenir des experts, donc c'est des choses qui peuvent prendre du temps. Et donc pour ça, on aime aussi beaucoup les dessins et modèles qui sont à la fois moins chers et qui peuvent être très efficaces parce qu'en un certain nombre de cas, on est face à des copies qui sont assez serviles dans lesquelles les gens ont tout copié. Et donc d'une part, c'est plus facile à reconnaître et d'autre part, c'est plus facile à faire reconnaître par, par la justice parce que ça se voit comme le nez au milieu de la figure que le design a été complètement recopié. Les produits contre lesquels on essaye de lutter parce qu'ils nous ont copiés, ils sont souvent dans les magasins physiques en même temps qu'ils sont sur, sur les plateformes internet. Ces, ces plateformes, il serait intéressant qu'on puisse leur donner l'ordre d'arrêter de vendre un certain nombre de produits à partir du moment où il y, y, y a des preuves, mais enfin, aujourd'hui ce n'est pas le cas. La France est le deuxième pays le plus impacté par la contrefaçon au monde si on regarde les saisies douanières, mais évidemment ce n'est pas le seul pays touché par la contrefaçon, donc il y a vraiment une nécessité de travailler ensemble à l'échelle internationale pour lutter contre ce fléau de la contrefaçon.
Et justement, pour en parler, nous sommes avec nous. Top et je vais passer la main à notre un panéliste avec nous, Sylvain de Stéphanie maître de conférence de l'International Study Center of Intellectual Properties, Stéphanie. Hello. And over to you, and then we'll have a Q&A session towards the end. And well, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome on the occasion of this panel discussion um, people involved in combating counterfeiting. Je ne suis pas le professeur Yann Bazir, directeur général. I'm not addressing you as the as the Yann Bazir professor. Uh, head uh, director of the P, and I am standing in as a professor is down with COVID, so um, I'm going to be moderating this roundtable focusing on the following topic, counterfeiting, and um, it's the um, uh, intellectual property dedicated research centre is very proud to take part in this colloquium and to contribute to this event, notably when it comes to scientific aspects. Our topic relates to new the new battle against counterfeiting. And to focus on such an essential topic, uh, we are happy to and we're delighted to welcome Paul Meyer, head of uh, com uh, the uh, EIPO, the uh, Union Office for Intellectual Property. Mr. Meyer, thank you very much for being with us from Alicante, if I'm not mistaken. Monsieur Oscar and we'll have uh, Mr. Oscar Alarcon, uh, Executive Secretary of the Committee of the Parties of the Medicrim Convention. Thank you very much again for taking part in this panel discussion online from Strasbourg. I believe Mrs. Corinne Cleostrat, Deputy Director of Legal Affairs and, and uh, counterfeiting of um, uh, customs and uh, excise. Uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, accepting to and uh, agreeing to contribute to this discussion as customs play a key role in combating counterfeiting. And then Mr. Christian Peugeot will address us. Uh, he's chair of IFAM, the Union of uh, Manufacturers, Union des Fabricants. Thank you very much for sharing your many initiatives in uh, uh, the field of uh, combating uh, counterfeiting, so anti uh, counterfeiting initiatives have been carried out. Uh, a similar uh, association uh, lies in Italy with the Indicam, uh, and we'll be delighted to have uh, Mrs. Lucia Tofana, the general director, and she will be addressing us from Rome. I believe Marie-Laure Bonaflou, uh, head of intellectual property of the Fendi Italian uh, fashion um, maison, will contribute to our discussion. And uh, we'd like to extend our thanks to her. She will be sharing with us her experience in uh, um, the field of anti-counterfeiting and the role of uh, anti-counterfeiting um, fighting in society. And then uh, May Berthelot, thank you very much for joining us. You're the director of the um, anti-counterfeiting for a well-known website, Vitresine Le Bon Coin, namely, and I'm sure that uh, you your address will be uh, fascinating, taking us all the way to the end of this uh, panel discussion. So you'll be telling us about the, pla the online platforms uh, and uh, with a, sort of, uh, a number of uh, hot topics at uh, the moment. And uh, so um, counterfeiting is about uh, civil and, um, and uh, criminal law. And, uh, um, uh, indeed, um, the counterfeiting is regarded in France as a plague. This is a rather strong term. Uh, but uh, counterfeiting itself calls for such strong terms. Uh, recent studies have shown that uh, when counterfeiting is uh, 
for money-making purposes, uh, is very much linked to organized crime, to networks of all kinds, trafficking of all kinds. So this is a most serious topic at that, a grave topic at that. So we are very much convinced of this um, fact. Uh, mm, every one of us uh, coming together here, and uh, we are well aware of uh, cultivating as a plague at, uh, within our organizations. We train experts in intellectual property, and this is uh, the hard raison d'être of NP. And uh, let's pledge uh, for um, people involved in politics to uh, and, uh, address uh, intellectual property and uh, so we can have a, a public debate. Uh, can you hear us? Okay. Well, we can point to um, counterfeit medicine, and uh, this has been a major topic. So, Medicream has been playing a very important role there in that. Can you tell us about um, the uh, initiatives um, developed within the uh, Council of Europe? Do tell us uh, about the existing cooperation with and within the EU well, first of all, hello. My apologies uh, for Mr. Kens not being with us, and, um, and I am standing in for him. Donc, uh, uh, is not, not cannot be with us uh, right now. Counterfeiting is a major issue, and counterfeit uh, in medicine and medical products uh, is a major um, phenomenon. And uh, we've, uh, in the video we've just watched, uh, reference has been made to uh, um, counterfeiting in medical products uh, and um, with a uh, uh, pandemic. Since 2017 until 2020, we've seen a rise by 38% in the number of uh, counterfeit products. So within Council of Europe, uh, we realized that uh, uh, counterfeiting in uh, medical products uh, is, has uh, risen exponentially. The, the current crisis uh, has alerted us, has drawn attention to the fact that uh, uh, there's been uh, uh, counterfeiting in medical Medical products, essentially vaccines, as well as medical devices, masks, testing kits, the uh, sanitizing gels, and so on. Uh, so this is a uh, reflection that uh, organized networks uh, are, uh, have been making money, and at the end of the day, what is ha this is what's happening today with these uh, um, organized uh, crime and uh, criminal networks. So the only way to uh, put an end to this uh, uh, counterfeiting phenomenon is about harmonizing, harmonizing um, the different legislation or uh, legal frameworks. We can talk about counterfeiting and forgeries, but as long as this situation is not uh, introduced in the criminal codes, nothing will be happening. And uh, we can still talk about counterfeiting Counterfeiting. counterfeiting will still go on. And the members of the uh, Council of Europe have now adopted a, uh, an agreement combating, and this is a sole uh, such agreement or convention, uh, fighting or combating uh, counterfeiting. We are uh, cooperating with Europol and Eurojust in uh, addressing counterfeiting with, uh, with Eurojust, with um, joint investigation teams. I don't know how this translates into French. So joint investigative uh, uh, teams uh, have focused on uh, uh, conducting uh, joint investigative work so as to identify the uh, source, the origins of these uh, uh, counterfeiting activities uh, and see how we can put an end to these counterfeiting activities. So this is within a, a joint investigative team that members of the EU reps, uh, have worked together, have joint forces uh, and uh, uh, to uh, come 
about uh, counter viewing. So the first team that uh, um, carried out such uh, investigative work has been a joint team between uh, uh, focusing, targeting, uh, uh, counterfeiting activities between Spain and uh, Austria. And uh, so uh, medical products have been identified as counterfeited. And this is a first ex such examples that has been uh, benefiting from the European and the EU framework. Uh, we've been working with Europol because they provide various uh, law enforcement operations uh, cooperating with the various uh, European countries, shield operations, baby boost operations, and the uh, uh, French uh, agence de la gendarmerie uh, combined for combining forces with the uh, uh, Carabinieri and the uh, Spanish poli uh, police forces uh, of joint forces. And this is only within the framework of uh, the EU that this uh, anti-counterfeiting activities uh, has been uh, strengthened, and we hope uh, that at the Council of Europe that the French presidency uh, will pursue those uh, objectives uh, as uh, um, the um, development of such uh, phenomenon is very harmful indeed. So maybe these uh, points uh, might elicit uh, um, some of the reactions amongst our panelists. I'd like to turn to Paul Mayer. You have an in-depth and very precise knowledge of counterfeiting in France and around the world. Could you possibly enlighten us in terms of the current situation? Uh, not very bright situation, as a matter of fact. Uh, how can we efficiently uh, fight against counterfeiting? Thank you very much. Yes, I'll try to. I shall be brief and I shall be concise. Uh, many figures have been put forward. The uh, uh, global trade of counterfeiting or counterfeited products uh, accounts for over 400 billion euros. The economy of the EU has, has been deeply impacted as a result of this phenomenon. And the uh, rule of law itself is questioned. Is challenged, and this results in a, a significant economic losses for the EU. And we've given you many, many figures, but one we haven't. 96% of the products exported from the EU to um, and the problem for us is not a problem within the EU, but a global phenomenon. As 90% of counterfeit um, products come from outside of the EU, so uh, consumers are economically hit, they have products of lesser qualities, and a minority of consumers have admitted buying counterfeited products. So uh, all of these consumers have been uh, ripped off at some point or another. Uh, these counterfeit products can be toys, can be medical products, uh, businesses, uh, 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 or loss, or lose, or um, impacted by loss of revenues, their investment capacities as a result of lost income is deeply impacted. And as a result of taking action, they have to incur significant costs when it comes to combating counterfeit products. And this involves many industrial sectors in and across the French economy. So public stakeholders are faced with a major problem. This, the rule of law is challenged. The law of incomes for um, tax-wise from our um, resulting from counterfeit products uh, can amount to several tens of billions um, every year. So how can we address the issue? The first word that comes to, uh, come to mind is cooperation. Everyone from the uh, uh, in, in uh, law enforcement uh, must cooperate. Uh, so private companies, private businesses, public sectors, and we need to be sufficiently and uh, uh, active and uh, skillful uh, for 
uh, to uh, encourage consumers not uh, to spend money on counterfeit products. We, uh, French businesses have to um, you know, benefit from in, uh, you know, the intellectual property infringements are ways uh, to uh, report risk of counterfeit products that we are uh, impact us. Employers, relationships, and employers and networks and uh, we'll talk to what we've been doing. We have to work at the regional, national, European levels all combined. There are four types of responses against counterfeiting and against piracy overall. We'll have to have adapted legal of framework uh, again in France. So we're working on a that it will improve combating uh, counterfeiting. Uh, you will have all some very highly protective uh, uh, legal framework have been uh, uh, frameworks have been put in place. We need to work on against organized uh, criminal network. We need to raise awareness amongst consumers and society at large uh, has to uh, uh, become aware of uh, the uh, magnitude of the problems of counterfeiting counterfeiting, and uh, businesses need to engage as much as possible. The EU has done um, has gone a long way in the field and continues uh, um, to uh, develop many initiatives. Uh, and DigiPro uh, published uh, a call for and uh, uh, position papers and interest uh, on this topic so that all the European interested parties uh, can provide their input in the field. And uh, the customs legislation, the EU customs legislation is going to be uh, revised in international national bodies, non-negotiating bodies, uh, make sure that our intellectual property uh, can be uh, uh, defended as much as possible in third-party countries. 96% of uh, products we export are uh, manufactured by in uh, IP intensive industries. And finally, we're delighted that, uh, in, uh, among the priorities uh, uh, to combat organized crimes, what we call the impact. The EU decided this year to uh, um, uh, put the uh, combating um, uh, and protection, uh, for the protection of IP and uh, anti counterfeiting activities, combined together, joining forces along Frontex, Olaf, uh, Europol, Europe. Just uh, combating counterfeiting is therefore spearheaded with and amongst all these organizations uh, European wide. And uh, um, when we request to better protect uh, intellectual property in Southeastern Asia, in China, this, uh, this is a necessity that we must uphold. Thank you very much, dear Paul. Very clear insights. Obviously, time uh, is playing against us. Uh, but uh, we could talk about these uh, topics at length. And uh, we have a new view, an international uh, view on all these. Um, can we maybe um, drill down, focusing on uh, combating counterfeiting nationwide. So you are uh, spearheading uh, anti-counterfeiting activities. Um, Mrs. Corinne Cleostrat, can you give us uh, an overview of uh, what customs are doing in France in the field of anti-counterfeiting activities? And can you tell us about the forms of counterfeiting activities uh, at this point in time? Thank you very much. A few figures, uh, many have been um, Kevin, and uh, just to illustrate uh, this uh, nationwide uh, phenomenon, in 2020 we seized 5.6 million counterfeit products uh, um, across many, many uh, um, fields uh, of the economy. And despite crisis, despite uh, the uh, travel bans and travel restrictions, uh, this um, uh, figures was um, on the increase in 2020 against 2019 uh, and uh, and this uh, relates to and these uh, quantities of counterfeit products uh, uh, were or the, made most of the uh, seizures uh, were in small packages and and um, uh, top of the list of these counterfeit products we find um, clothing, accessories, shoes, 
clothing accessories, and then games, toys for our young target consumers, and then electrical and electronic equipment, telephone, medicines, medical products uh, fall into these seized counterfeit products. So you've talked about counterfeiting as a plague, and uh, combating counterfeiting is a challenge for us. This is gaining momentum. I I said 5.6 million in 2020, so 1994, uh, we used to seize 200,000 items. So you can see that the phenomenon has been really on the rise. And um, I'm not going to announce figures that will be announced, but uh, as, as just a, we're going to be, uh, you know, having updated figures on uh, recent counterfeiting activities, and this will show that there are still on the up. So what can we do to address this plague? We need to collaborate. We need to collaborate with public stakeholders. And we have and like to hail the work and salute the work of NPE, the National Institute of International Property. Uh, we have signed an agreement with them so as to strengthen the protection of businesses, uh, raising awareness as to the necessity for them to file their uh, rights, and that is absolutely essential. And I'd like to talk to all of the businesses. Uh, report uh, request for uh, intervention because customs. I'm going to give you the latest possible uh, figures. We're talking 1,700 uh, intervention requests, and uh, so again, the phenomenon is on the rise. It's important for us because uh, it is within this request that we'll find all the useful information as to intellectual property property and a way that we can detect within this increasing flow, uh, notably in retail, um, how we can detect these counterfeit products. No, of course, we are cooperating with the various platforms as well, so that they communicate all the information, all the useful data on uh, such announcements. And we ask them as well to shut down certain accounts in order to that they withdraw some of these announcements or all these claims. Uh, and then we also tell them that the sale of fake goods online is, uh, online is forbidden. In any case, let me tell you, it's a crime in France. It is a crime. It's also a customs crime. In other words, uh, you can even go to jail for three years. And if this fake is made, done by organized bands, then it's 10 years that you get from 10 years in prison. So for us, uh, counterfeiting represents a major stake for our health and um, security and safety. And what we must be aware of, because we run it's feeding all sorts of non underground networks in France and in Europe because we work a lot in joint programs. Just before Christmas, we dismantled a whole network with Italian and Spanish colleagues, uh, Belgium, Belgian, uh, da Danish, etc., of uh, toys, of toys, fake toys, which were flooding the market. And before that, it was uh, household goods, particularly detergents, you know, that were flooding the market and which was organized uh, trafficking. Was so in other words, organized crime even now uh, is um, going on and we just uh, brought down certain um, workshops you know illegal li 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 uh, workshops where they were making fake perfumes with fluids coming uh, from other countries and of course the employees working there were working in subhuman conditions completely of course uh, others were making money hand over fist as you might imagine and when we went uh, visiting we could see that it's also true that people at the head of such networks are delinquents who in the past uh, not so long ago were also in drug trafficking and narcotics and so this is a criminal profile that we have to fight plus uh, fakes uh, that we've been fighting for the last two years has been very useful thanks to the help of public authorities and UNIFAB. Thank you very much, UNIFAB. You helped us very much in training our uh, customs agents and officers. So thanks to training, now we have contact people in various areas and we can count on them really to enact certain plans and enforce certain plans, uh, which uh, I hope will yield results. Well, thank you so much, Corinne. Thank you so much for your presentation of the action plan. 
we'll come back to it perhaps uh, through questions. Now, how about the companies uh, that make uh, all this? Uh, Mr. Christian Peugeot. Au président and I'm de talking now to the president of the French, uh, president of the French Association of the Promotion and Defense of Intellectual Property Rights, Unifab. So perhaps you could help me out with this one. If I were to sum it up, these figures were mentioned by my neighbor over here. There's a, an increase of uh, 200,000 to 6 million, and that is reality. A few years ago, about 20 years ago, fake goods was just at a low level, literally handicraft level. And and these are products that you got back uh, on coming back from holidays. Now it's been completely industrialized. It's on a large scale. Even all these uh, counterfeited <laughs> products are much closer to the real stuff. So this is the new development, and it's essentially that. And the second thing I'd say is, you mentioned it, the kind of trafficking has also changed a lot, uh, because now with express deliveries, express freighting, you can bring in products more easily. And, of course, the customs guys are not always there to stop them. We do, we've caught quite a few, but there are many more who've come in and who just slip between the, the loopholes. So in the light of all these new developments, uh, Mr. President, what can we do? What should we do? How, should we, how do we prevent it? Well, what I'd like to mention is that all these forgerers, you mentioned that very quickly, they're not specialists of uh, counterfeiting. Generally, it's all networks, huge networks, criminal networks, uh, gangs uh, that use uh, forgery also because it's not punished as much. You see what I mean? It's a side business for them. It's, a, it's like a mafia operating, and it's a huge, mean, money-making machine, and it's difficult to fight them. Huh? And now with COVID, as a result, all these uh, forgerers are bringing in also all sorts of new fake products with no problems at all. So that's the background to the whole, the whole thing. Plus, uh, what I'd like to say is that we must also fight uh, the fact that um, forgerers and fakers, uh, thanks to photos of real products, they can actually tell future consumers that uh, their fake products are almost as good or as good as the real stuff. So they buy it at almost the same price as the real one. Of course, they're not disappointed. They love it. So that adds uh, more fuel to the fire. So normally, fakes are not so great. They are cheap. But sometimes it could also be a product which is so close to the real thing that uh, you can't tell the difference. So because of all these reasons, it makes things very difficult. What are we supposed to do? Huh? Well, we can do a lot, lots, lots. Now, we have a few missions. Now, at UNIFAB uh, is, of course, uh, to communicate as much as we can on this point and uh, explain to the uh, final end consumer all the dangers and the risks involved with buying fake goods, uh, you know, from the personal point of view, health point of view, safety point of view. And in our communication, in fact, my neighbor here mentioned it to me. And she's uh, one of the people who shares these messages as well. So there's um, training, you mentioned it, and training, yes, of course, uh, of our um, customs agents, and normally that was done face to face, but now things have gone online. I do hope we get back to talking person to person. Of course, we have video conferences. We have hybrid um, formats now in order to keep training, because it's a must. So at UNIFAB, of course, we are trying to talk more and more to the institutional authorities in France and in Europe, and then more generally. We need to talk about it, discuss it, and uh, bring in all, talk about all the new methods, the new uh, elements, share the right practices, and so on. So now to end it all, and then talking about the theme, which is innovation, the new way to combat counterfeiting innovation and enforcement of IP rates, uh, well, we've got technological innovation. We've got Unifab Lab that we've set up with quite a few of our partners and startups and a lot of uh, innovative uh, solutions and so on, Bla blockchain, tracking. Uh, 
and um, these are themes that, you know, identification goes supl supplied by brands. Then there's the legislation. Now, in France, we're pretty lucky at a national level because there's a new uh, draft resolution to fight uh, counterf uh, counterfeiting. So uh, Christian Blanchet and Pierre-Yves Bonazel voted that in, and finally, it was essentially accepted uh, to a great extent. It should normally go to the Senate and then um, be accepted. But things are happening. Things are happening. But at a European level, let's say it's a, in a disarray. The Digital Services Act, uh, DGS, which is of course extremely important, is had gotten off to a very bad start because now the European Parliament haven't really understood the importance. Uh, now there's certain key points uh, that of course uh, must get across, uh, and that is transparency and transformation for consumers, identification and verification of uh, the sellers, and then freezing of accounts of all these of these fraud accounts. It seems to be quite obvious but apparently it's not the case. We've got to fight to get people to understand at a European level to do all this. And let me just end on another sensitive issue. Now, in the digital age, everyone's going digital. So you've got metaverse and all sorts of funny words that I didn't know about. And that creates all sorts of very serious problems, it's especially when it comes to law and IP. What rights? What law? Is it uh, royalties? Is it um, author's rights? What is it? You know, what can we do to help ourselves and to defend ourselves? And how do we defend our rights in this kind of metaverse, uh, digital universe? And then what is a crea uh, how can we say that the uh, counterfeited item is not a creation finally and therefore a new piece of art or whatever? So these are questions to be answered as positively as possible in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Peugeot. Now, Mrs. Lucia Tufanen, we see what, was, what is being done in France of this association. Now, you work for a similar kind of institution. Perhaps you could tell us uh, what the impact of uh, forgery and counterfeiting is on uh, the Italian uh, economy, and also tell us uh, what you are doing. Hi, hello. I'm so sorry I don't speak French. I mean, I'm the only one in this panel, but thank you for the invitation. Yeah, the uh, Italy, like France, is very impacted and effective country uh, when it comes to IP crimes, um, mainly because of the excellence of our industry and our business. And... Uh, the national sector uh, is the um, well is is one of the things that we have to uh, help and protect. So the impact of counterfeiting is huge and difficult to track in its extent. We have listened from Paul Meyer, data and figures, and just to focus on Italy, data indicate more than. 10.5 billion euro, the impact of Italian, uh, on Italian economy of uh, counterfeiting business, uh, with an impact uh, very high to un unemployment and businesses, even more worrying if we think that more than 47% uh, of the national GDP is generated by industries investing in IP the same uh, industry that we have to protect if we want that our economy uh, is, uh, will be competitive in the, in the digital world. Uh, in Italy, Guardia di Finanza is the finance police and the custom. Uh, in the past 10 years, have carried out about uh, 200,000 seizures for from counterfeiting and confiscating more than uh, 500 million items without counting food and beverage, pharma and tobacco products. So this uh, huge amount of uh, counterfeited pro products, um, it's not all the uh, counterfeited products present in the market. Uh, the number in these last years uh, really are increasing. The number of items suffer uh, dramatic drops 
due to the increase of small parcels traffic and uh, e-commerce. Uh, we already uh, listened about the importance of blocking trafficking and counterfeiting products online and collaborate and cooperate uh, uh, with the platform. Uh, they have to take action on this and be proactive of this uh, word, uh, it's crucial the role of our association, like Indicame Unifab, to enhance cooperation. Thank you, Lucia, for the precision and for all the actions. Thank you very much uh, for all that you said uh, and all that you're doing within Indicam. So now we have the point of view of the various institutions and the various associations. And now perhaps uh, Marie-Laure Bonneuf, who perhaps you could tell us uh, what um, companies are doing in fighting uh, counterfeiting, particularly all that has been done by Fendi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, and thanks very much for inviting us for to this panel, I just uh, make a comment in passing. I think it's extremely great uh, the initiative that the France is taking, especially under the French presidency, to have dedicated a whole day on intellectual property via the INPI. And for me, as a, a representative of law in my company, it's a very strong signal that's been sent out, even at the European level. And I do hope the next presidency will continue to maintain this high level. Now, fighting fraud has been going on for several years, and I've been following up on it since then. And I would say that it's remained extremely flexible in change. And in the last two years, what with the pandemic, as you said, Stephanie, earlier, when you referred to the scourge, because this counterfeiting is a pandemic in the pandemic. I'm probably saying things pretty obvious, but consumers have changed their habits completely now, they're buying habits. We saw that, and I think that was the immediate uh, collateral effect of a pandemic, because people were stuck at home. Anyone with a computer and anyone with a phone, a um, smartphone, which I think is most of us, uh, can buy either the real, genuine stuff or uh, a fake uh, on an app, on the internet, just by connecting to all sorts of e-commerce sites, any kind of online site, or it could be via Facebook, or it could be Instagram, etc., etc. So this uh, phenomenon, uh, as, was, as you've heard already, has had a huge impact. So now it's gone worldwide, it's really gone viral, as you do know that uh, counterfeiting is never just local, and here we've seen the impact. Uh, it's multifold. It's extremely powerful because now counterfeiting impacts everyone everywhere and it's accessible everywhere. All right, so very quickly, because I know people have said this before, since I'm based in Italy and I am a legal expert, there are three points that I'd like to underline in my presentation, and that is the side effect of 2020 where we saw online and offline merge together. Apart from that, and it was a real pleasure to hear all that from you, what the importance of international cooperation was. Maybe I can give you more details later. And then finally, last but not least, the costs, in fact, of fake goods. Because as a law expert, in the earlier panels, we were talking about uh, intellectual property rights as being an investment. Uh, so fighting uh, fake uh, and uh, fraud, we were discussing it with our uh, financial team. They don't see it in the same way. For them, it's a, it's an endless well, and you can just keep spending, spending, spending. And so we need to explain it all to them to tell them where we're going. But I'll just get back to that. Now, as far as 2020 side impacts are concerned, it was, as I said, online and offline merged and became one. And uh, the offline experience in the field when it wasn't digital was is the same as what you find online. We talked about um, uh, training, training for customs officers, for um, uh, the police forces in general, the enforcement forces. But when it's online and talking to um, platforms and su suppliers and other pr service providers who help us do the monitoring and explain how these products can be tracked. 
because here you're violating the rights of, uh, because there is intellectual property rights and also you're violating the tracking of these products. Uh, so these are things that we need to make um, uh, other uh, partners more aware of. It's also a question of uh, rights for the industry and also with the customs. We've mentioned it to the customs at a European level and we need to do the same thing in the USA, in China, in Korea. In fact, all the countries in which we do know there's a lot of production of fake goods and that these countries will transit through and come to a given final destination. So it's important in that case uh, to record, to register your intellectual property rights. And one last point, the new strategy that we have tried to, uh, abs uh, to apply is an acceleration of things with COVID because to fight online fraud, we had already um, all sorts of systems, you know, there's, for instance, a kind of monitoring that helps you to follow up on certain products. But now things have really moved up in terms of volume. I know I'm repeating myself, but uh, the volumes have gone up tenfold or even twentyfold. And there's also further sophistication in the way in which all these goods are shown and produced. And Mr. Peugeot, you mentioned that to us already. The consumer is a bit baffled and lost. And that's where the fraud is, because what is shown is not what he might actually receive. And the second point is the importance of cooperation at an international level. I know Paul Mayer mentioned it. But what I must insist on when it comes to international cooperation is, uh, is uh, as a law expert, it's extremely important to have attached IPs. And that's our battle horse today because there have been several cases uh, like in China or in the USA where without having this contact, you know, we are semi-institutional, we have that kind of contact, and there are certain uh, circumstances in which we wouldn't have been able to solve the problem. The NP already has a very big and extensive technical network with attached IPs, and that's just an example that we must follow up. In the UK, Switzerland, uh, USA, they've also got the same standards. Italy's only just started. They have started extending its network. In Europe, we always have a European contact person, at least in the more strategic countries. And I think it would be extremely more important, extremely important uh, for small businesses, a small SME in France, which is suddenly confronted with uh, counterfeiting in China, you know, for a patent or for a brand, which is a vital component uh, for its sales, needs to have a contact person who can help them, who can help them to uh, navigate in the uh, various processes. Uh, and as a law expert, of course, we've got the means to do it. We have represented representatives on the spot who help us, uh, but once again, I do hope that with the French presidency and even later that the role of attached IPs will be given more importance and uh, advertised and publicized. Now the costs. <coughs> We mentioned it in an earlier panel. There are three elements concerning uh, costs. Now, we can't respect or defend uh, the violation of right if uh, the law, the rights don't exist. So we must have a registered and valid right so which are maintained and uh, renewed. That's the first thing, and it costs money. We talked about designs and models, and those cost a little bit more than a brand. But depending on the countries, it's not exactly the same way of doing it. It's not exactly the same uh, legislation. So it all depends on how the law is uh, inscribed in all this. So we need to have some sort of strategy concerning intellectual property. The second one is the cost of monitoring. And here I'm talking more about online. We must have technical uh, uh, providers. Uh, who have all the right devices and who have the matrix uh, 
and who can educate uh, their um, agents, really, to recognize uh, the original product and what is, is the real stuff and what is the real characteristics of the real stuff. And once that's done, they can go and browse through all the various platforms to look for the fake ones. So here we find the sellers, we find, uh, um, in fact, uh, just where it's all made. Last point, which is a bit tricky, and this concerns the offline, and that is the cost of destruction of these products, uh, the storage, uh, because once these products are seized and the work's been done, a decision's been made at a European level, of course, it can be given to the various uh, uh, law experts now, uh, those who have the rights. And now, of course, there's a cost uh, system that's been set up. Uh, they do that in Germany and in for, uh, now as a, for a company. I have to explain to the financial manager why the budget has gone from, let's say, uh, 10 to now it's 50,000 because there's a destruction cost and that's why my budget's gone up. And so that's an open uh, question. So it's something on which uh, we must work at a European level to make sure that those who have these rights uh, have, uh, have a transparent approach to cost uh, calculation. We talk about compliance. It's extremely important that we have compliance here and all these services which are used to destroy the fake goods. So I'm ending with an open question, and I thank you once again for listening to me. Well, thanks very much, dear Mary Laure. I am sure that people listening to us would fully agree with you. And I think uh, they would agree to an extension of uh, the use of these platforms. So, dear Mr. Ber Ms. Berthelot, can you tell us about all that you're doing within all the platforms that you're working on to prevent or uh, reduce the dissemination of these articles? Let me give you the background. I'll go back to 2018. There are two platforms on the one side. You've got V Dressing, which specializes in fashion and luxury items, uh, second uh, uh, hand ones. Uh, plus, uh, there's a guarantee of uh, hap uh, happy or reimbursed. And at the and then you've got Le Bon Coin, which is a leader of uh, these small advertisements that you see. And then end of 2018, Dressing, V Dressing, the platform that I come from originally, was bought up. And firstly, there was a change in transactions. Uh, today, you can pay on Le Bon Coin because these transactions, these operations are really monitored. You take uh, the person's phone number, you ring up that person, and you get in touch with them. And apart from this change, you can also retrieve the know-how of the V-dressing teams. That started in 2018, uh, in 2020, and it was a real challenge for us uh, for several reasons. So, because we came from a platform which wasn't really so small, and we got to the giant uh, with between 800,000 to 8 million um, announcements uh, for uh, 73 categories. Categories, 29 million users per month uh, that uh, browse on the site. So it was huge, and it was a huge challenge for us, uh, particularly when we saw the processes, knowledge, expertise that we had in the past, and how are we going to actually scale it up to such huge volumes. So we set up a strategy. It was really quite a learning experience. And we based our strategy on four pillars. We used our past experience with V-dressing, and we did a lot of work on keywords. All the keywords which would help us to uh, trace uh, fake goods, certain models, uh, which we coupled with the uh, um, rates, uh, because we know that um, uh, fakers like to reproduce models that are a great hit, a popular buy, and then, of course, certain category of products. Now, we do know that there can be a price threshold depending on whether it's a handbag, a, a watch, a earpods, or whatever. 
So all this data was put into an algorithm in order to detect and block these products that were fake, to which we add more general data, for instance, all sorts of tips and gimmicks in order to... Also, we do a human check, a human inspection, just in case a user's a, a signal, something like that, or those who have paid for their rights. So thanks to all this, was there any special solution that you had? Did you have some sort of cooperation with those who well, had the rights? Well, now I think we must all cooperate together. That's my firm conviction. Otherwise, the takedown note will never work. Really, for it to work, we must be together and uh, go beyond all our so-called jealousies and uh, competition. That's what we've learned within the company. And so we've got HenCheck, and that enables all those uh, service providers and those who've paid for intellectual uh, property to have an account on uh, Le Bon Coin and then uh, uh, warn, uh, send an early warning system for any fake uh, sites. And so normally we react within a few minutes or a few hours. We've really made a lot of progress. It's a very complicated process, and I must say we've got a handle on it. Another important point is uh, that we can also collect a lot of uh, uh, information from service providers and uh, those who have the rights to use, they give us profiles, all the info that they've collected, and that helps us uh, when we develop our algorithms. It's extremely important. And to react to what Marie-Laure said, even for uh, platforms, it costs a lot of money to fight a fix. Uh, it's extremely difficult to justify it, particularly if it's a, the, uh, a private company Company. Why am I doing it and why, how does it help? So let me give you a few figures which are extremely important and that we've never really published. It's extremely interesting. In 2021, we blocked uh, 71 million euros worth of uh, fake goods were blocked. The sales of such fake goods were blocked. And of course, we are still trying to go further, but I'm sure it'll be much bigger. Hmm. And now for uh, images, sound and electronics and uh, all, all such things. And there were other categories also that we hadn't really explored. All that uh, represents 70 million, 70 million million users and 70 million uh, sellers, literally. It's huge. And one last victory, which was in October 2021, we changed our process to, to uh, install sanctions on certain users. They're blocked. They can't use their account and they can't use the uh, site for an indefinite period. And that was a major victory for us. Big thank you. I think this testimonial um, really brings all that we're talking about to life. I think uh, that our discussions will elicit um, reflections. Uh, maybe a few questions before handing it over to the public. I'd like to extend my thanks to all of you for the quality of your contributions. Over to you. More questions. Uh, well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Fascinating discussions. Uh, we have very little time for questions. Uh, short and concise answers will be expected. Uh, so, question number one how can we uh, help uh, anti counterfeiting? Paul, are you still there? I'm still there. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, how can artificial intelligence assist uh, uh, anti-counterfeiting? Well, AI can help anti-counterfeiting, but it can be uh, used by criminals as well. So, if we are on the right side of, uh, on the right side of law, we have. Uh, you know, leverage, but artificial intelligence re requires data, and we can uh, have early interventions. Uh, we can spot uh, our criminal activities uh, early, thanks to uh, AI. AI will also enable to map out uh, the modus operandi, and if we have, uh, I mean, we're very much protected by the uh, GDPR, but uh, as a result of this, is well. 
help us to be way more efficient in combating organized crime. And obviously, uh, Europol, France, uh, will uh, have uh, well have come to uh, have signed agreement this week at the Council of Europe, and uh, we can leverage this to dismantle, to take down the uh, criminal networks. So artificial intelligence entails many hopes, and um, we'll be publishing a study in the next few days on the impact of our AI on um, infringement of our copyrights and science and models. So uh, be uh, so watch this space. Maybe a final question. We're talking about artificial intelligence uh, as being instrumental in anti-counterfeiting activities. There's also international cooperation as well. Corinne, uh, this question. Uh, you're talking about uh, customs, international uh, cooperation. Can you give us an example of uh, such cooperations outside of uh, Europe? Yes. I remember beautiful cooperation on uh, counterfeit goods uh, of wine. This might come as a surprise to you, and uh, including in Latin American countries. And thanks to our colleagues from these countries, uh, we've been able to, uh, de de to detect such fraud and put an end to it. Uh, so this uh, took a few months of uh, investigative work, but this um, you know, we do have long-standing cooperation agreement with uh, Latin American countries, and this enables us to act swiftly. I thought uh, French wine was the best. It couldn't be counterfeited. Well, there you go. So there we are. Thank you very much. And maybe, Stephanie, very quickly, a closing remark. Uh, can you thank your panelists and uh, close this session? Well, big thank you to all our panelists. Uh, and I think we can wrap up on this, uh, this success story that we've just described. Thank you very much. Uh, we will definitely uh, watch this space. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, stay with us. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes for the closing addresses. So we're going to be closing this program with uh, uh, Claustine Gonya from DigiGrow and Jamal Kavanaugh, who is with us. Thank you very much, and see you very shortly indeed.